Hey, thank you, team, for pointing us to Jesus. It's so good to worship together. Hey, nothing else will do. Christ alone is our focus as we worship him. I want you to grab a Bible. Uh, we're going to dive into the scriptures. You can, in fact, turn to Romans. We'll be in Romans 8 here in just a moment. Grab a journal, a pen. If your kids are kind of running around, hey, point them to kids worship. If you can't listen to this sermon all the way through right now, do so before the day's out because we are going to be unified around what God is speaking into our specific congregation, what God is teaching us in these days. You know, for 10 days, we've been trapped. We've been isolated. 10 weeks. Okay, 10 years. We've been <laughs> trapped. We've been locked down, unable to live our lives. And we want things to open up. And it's slowly happening. In fact, next week, we're going to be coming at you. Phase two, we've said worship leaders from our campus. We're going to come at you from Ellis Chapel. So we're excited about taking steps in the days to come. Our restart team is doing a great job as we, we think about uh, coming back on with a joyful, safe you know, presence back on our campuses. Uh, we've said that we're going to move to our different venues then online. And then ultimately, you, you'll be invited to come, those who can, to come and worship us sometime there in July. We'll keep you focused. Uh, focused on that and keep you posted as we move forward. Now, uh, we've got incredible uh, leaders, our staff, and many uh, members of our church who are involved in this, experts speaking into it, people like Dr. Tyler Cooper. I talked to Kelvin Baggett. He's the new, uh, the mayor's health and healthcare access czar. Sounds like a real important person, incredible man of faith. We were talking this week about how we can open our churches safely and how to best go about that. So that's our first task is to keep us all safe, but we want to worship God together because we all remember, don't we? We have a vision of the way it used to be. And we look back, it seems like, sure enough, 10 years ago or so, but we remember we have a vision of the way things used to be pre-coronavirus. Uh, but today I want to talk about something you've never experienced before, something we've never seen before. In fact, this is the ultimate new normal. This is the forever new normal. Now, if you've been with us over these many weeks, this identity series, we started right after Easter, if you can believe that. And we said, okay, now that Easter has taken place, Christ's death on the cross, his burial and resurrection, what has happened? How does that impact my life? Kind of so what in my life now? So we started with what, what's really, it's called the Ordo Salutis. You didn't know this, but we were walking through, been walking through the order of salvation, concepts of Christian soteriology, it's called. Really understanding salvation. As we think about fixing our eyes on Jesus and what has happened, what drives our lives. We started with this big word propitiation, which means that Christ became really our wrath satisfier. The punishment for our sin came upon him on the cross. Then we move to regeneration where God comes into our hearts. He changes our hearts. He gives us a gift of faith that we're even able to turn to him and receive his gift of salvation. We then move to justification. We talked about the great exchange. Just as if I'd never sinned is how we talk about that. Just as if I'd never sinned or if I've always obeyed. The great exchange means that, that, that he, though I have sinned, the Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, that's a kind of a strange way to say that. We're going to talk about that today. He doesn't say falling short of the standard of God. Falling short of the glory of God. See, glory really encompasses Christ uh, or, or God's character. It's an expression of his character, namely his holiness. This is his glory. And so we're going to talk about this today. But glory is really kind of all encompassing. We'll get there. But then we started talking about reconciliation. We said that God's reconciled. We were enemies, but we've been reconciled with him. And then he's called us to this cultural mandate of reconciliation, that we're involved in reconciling people to one another and reconciling people to God. I mean, this past week I was in a Zoom call with a group of guys who have been meeting together for about nine years. Members from Park Cities, members from Concord Church. So we, we got essentially white, you know, guys and black guys coming together across, uh, across ethnicities, you know, across racial lines saying, man, we're going to get to know each other. And they've done that. These guys love each other. They're doing life together. This is the, that's just one aspect of reconciliation. Then we moved on to sanctification last week. This process of becoming like Jesus. It's, it's, it's what we seek to do. And when you, you come to faith and you, you come to, to become more and more like Jesus, sanctified, to become holy 
like him. So if you've been with us, we said, man, you're loved. Uh, you, you're, you're received by him. You're completely forgiven, fully accepted. And today I want to talk about how you are going to be changed. We will be changed, each one of us. You see, there's a lot to this, right? You're like, all of this that I've said so far, it's like, wow, that's a lot, right? It's like life is hard, and, and just because you come to Christ doesn't mean that things are going to get easier. I could argue that yeah, things could get harder in some ways. I mean, sanctification, living out this life of holiness, it's hard. And sometimes you feel like you take a, a few steps forward and then you take a few steps back. It's tough to follow Jesus in our day. You might even wonder sometimes, why bother? I mean, have you ever thought about giving up? I know that I have. I mean, even as a Christian, I'm like, man, this is, you know, what's going to keep me going? And what's going to keep us going is wrapped up in a singular, power-packed, weighty word. And the word is glorification. That's what we're going to talk about today. But before we dive into the passage in Romans 8, uh, I want to talk about this word. we got to understand, what is glorification? You see the word glory. Glory means doxa in the Greek. It means, uh, it's an expression, again, of God's character. It's holiness, His perfection. So glorification is, is this process by which uh, God removes, it's the final removal of sin. Can you imagine that? Not having sin, not having to wrestle with sin, it's the final removal of sin that takes place because of his death and resurrection. And when he returns, there'll be a final moment of glorification when we will be glorified. And, and, and as we'll see today, this glorification to come is incomparable, it's universal, and it's personal. And it's described in this passage we're going to look at, contained in Romans 8. I want you to turn to Romans 8, and we're going to look at verses 18 through 25. See, the problem, again, with glorification is that it's a future orientation. We've never seen it before. We've not experienced this. Now, we've got glimpses of it. Uh, when we look back, okay, you got to go back to the beginning, Genesis 1 and 2, before sin enters the world. We see Adam and Eve, this perfect communion with God, perfect relationship with God. But then we, we also see it in Jesus. We see a really a personal aspect of this when we look at Christ. We, he, he's the, the glory of God in human form. John said, we've seen him, the glory of the Father in his Son. But we also see the glorification that is to come for us when we look at Jesus in those post-resurrection appearances. He's glorified. He has this resurrected body and we can see then a, a sense of what our bodies will be like when we're glorified. All right, but, but look at uh, Romans 8, uh, verses 20, uh, I mean 18 through 25. We're going to see a picture. We're going to capture a picture of, of this, this kind of future that we have. Jesus steps out of the fog of the future in his resurrection. And he gives us a picture of what our lives are to be. But hey, again, unlike the pre-coronavirus lives that we have, which seems like so long ago, we could at least remember, right, what it was like. But with glorification, you can't do that. And so Paul's going to help us. And what I'm praying for is a redeemed imagination. How about this? A redeemed vision for what our future is going to look like because it drives everything. See, how will you finish the task if you don't know what you're building, right? How will you cross the finish line if you don't know where it is? How will you keep pressing on and endure the race if you don't know what the prize is? Today, I want you to see it. And in so doing, we will be challenged to press on, to keep pressing on. Why we should never give up in following Jesus and why he's worth everything in our lives. Indeed, he is life. Look at what it says here in verse 18. For I consider, this is Paul, that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Paul's saying there's a comparison here. So there's suffering in this life. We've all experienced that. And there's glory. And he says, uh, I'd say this, imagine a scale. okay? And he's saying, hey, it, it, what tips the scale is the weight of glory. It's like a ton up against the a feather, right? He says, it's not even worth comparing. 
what we're going through now and the glory that is to come. So the first thing I want you to see is this. The first thing, glorification is incomparable. All right. Everybody's talking about the coronavirus being unprecedented. I'll tell you what's unprecedented is our glorification. It's the glory to come. And Paul says our focus on the glory is more profitable than the focus on the weight, okay, the attention that we give to our suffering. And this is from a guy that suffered, all right? This is not from a guy who didn't have an easy, who had an easy life. Think about it. His whole, if you want to read his resume, all right, his, his kind of autobiography of suffering, all you got to do is go to 2 Corinthians 11. You can look at verses 23 through 27, and, and it, it shows the way, Paul talks about the way he suffered, right? If, if Paul can compare his list of suffering that we see there in other places and still say the glory is worth it all to follow Jesus, then we should do the same. I want us to, I want us to do what Paul has done Be, because it, it changed his life. This is the key to a life surrendered before God. Look at what he says. He says, I consider... This means I fully examined. I have checked this out. He has thought deeply about this. Think about this. He's reflected on this in a dark prison cell. I mean, he, he's reflected this on this while adrift at sea, wondering if he's going to die. He's reflected on this. He's considered this as he's heading to the whipping post. He's reflected on this as a raging mob gathers around him with stones to kill him and they leave him there like roadkill, thinking he's dead. He's reflected on this and he is saying, listen, all of this, all of this is worth staying committed to Christ. What was the vision that he saw that kept him focused? Well, surely it was Christ on the cross, all that he had done for him, but it was also this future vision of glory that he knew was coming. The vision was the glory of God to come. His glorification. Is it, is it yours? You might be saying, well, I'm not even sure what it looks like. Okay, hang on. Because this is the thing that keeps driving us forward. Is it worth following Jesus? Again, do you ever feel like giving up? I know I have. There have been times I've just wanted to give up. And some of you might be thinking today, Pastor, if you knew what I was going through, I mean, all that I'm going through, I, you'd want to give up too. No, 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 no. Listen, you stay in, you continue because the glory is worth it. We often think our struggles are, you know, kind of unique to us. But Paul would remind us in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, he says kind of the same thing. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. That's what he's saying here in Romans 8. Consider that we're going through, you know, what we're going through right now. Unprecedented, you know, the defining event for a generation, many have said. Now, here's what's wild. A lot of us, it wasn't too long ago, we remember 9-11, right? Our graduates this year, okay, weren't even born. All right, so this is a defining event for them. But we're seeing until a vaccine, you know, I'm trusting a vaccine is going to come. We're praying for one. But what we're seeing this trickle-down effect, I think, for years to come. We're going to see that, you know, the impact, particularly in, in, in third world countries and in all aspects of American life have been have been rattled. And and we're seeing a long lasting impact. And I believe that's going to be the case. But here's the thing. There'll be more to come. I mean, this life is filled with with struggle and trials and and loss and grief and ultimately death. Right. Look at what he says in verse 19. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. See, here creation is personified. It's anthropomorphized. I mean, we, 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 we join all creation groaning and longing for something. And you might even know, not know what it is. That's the problem with a lot of us. It's like being hungry and nothing sounds good. You don't even know what you crave. You don't even know what you want. That's the hope of glory is what you want. That's where we're all leaning. You know, something is wrong. Something's not right. Everybody knows it, but we don't know what it is. It's the hope of glory within us. So look at this. This glorification is not only incomparable, it's universal. It's universal. All of creation is longing for redemption and for a little perspective in this moment. I want you to think about this. If you were born, imagine you were born in 1900, all right? It's like a, like a much simpler time, right, of life. 
Well, then comes your 14th birthday, World War I. And that lasts until your 18th birthday. 22 million people perish in that war, including a lot of your friends who go off to Europe to fight for freedom. Later that year, check it out, 1918, the Spanish flu. It, it, it ravishes the world. I mean, it hits the planet and it runs till your 18th birthday. Up to 50 million people die in those two years. 50 million people, nearly 700,000 Americans, not 100,000, 700,000, seven times more Americans died than in the Great War. Now, on your 29th birthday, you're not even 30, the Great Depression <laughs> begins. Unemployment hits 25%. World GDP drops 27%. That runs until you're 38. The country nearly collapses along with the world economy. And if you're blessed, you have a job, you're making $300 a year, almost a dollar a day. But hang on, you're not yet 39. You turn 39, World War II. You've hardly hit midlife, don't catch your breath, because if you lived in London or most of continental Europe, uh, you're bombing in your neighborhood, invasion of the enemy, okay, artillery, tanks coming through your neighborhood was a daily event. Thousands of American young men join the army to defend freedom with their lives. In between your 39th, 45th birthday, 75 million people die in that war. Over 400,000 Americans. At 50, the Korean War begins. Five million perish. At 55, the Vietnam War begins. 20 years this war goes on. And then your 62nd birthday, you're kind of thinking about retirement. There's the Cuban Missile Crisis, a tipping point in the Cold War. And if it weren't for sensible leaders at the time, I mean, life on the planet as we know it could have ended. All of creation, here's the point, that's one generation. That's one lifetime. And I'm saying that, and I'm the ultimate optimist, there's more to come. Because all of creation has been impacted by the fall. And, and, and creation trembles and will continue to do so until what we long for becomes reality. What is this thing? It's glorification. It's what, it's what we're looking for. It's incomparable. It's universal. Look at verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Now, what is all this? All of creation is subjected to the fall. And the impact of the fall, the impact of humanity on the destruction of creation can't be under, uh, I mean, overstated. I mean, humanity has an antagonistic relationship with creation. Uh, rather than rule the creation as loving stewards of God's gifts, we try to bend her to our will and force her to yield whatever you know, we, we want without much thought for future generations. Verse 22, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in pains of childbirth until now. Again, creation is personified. Creation groans for the righteous, good image bearer to oversee her, not the failing and frustrating image bearers who are more like Adam, uh, who, who are not good stewards of the earth and all of creation. It was our failure that subjected creation to, to futility. Or rather, it, it was the event. It was an event. It was the fall. It was our sin. But doesn't it make sense then that it would be the restoration, the recreation of such a disobedient species, okay, us, that would trigger a renewal of the rest of creation. See, glorification is incomparable. It is cosmic, okay, it's universal. And finally, glorification is, is personal. I want to get personal as we close. Look at verse 23. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, okay, the first installment, grown inwardly, as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our bodies. Okay, now look, we will be glorified. All right, Jesus is the first installment of the resurrection, the first fruit 
of all who would come to faith in him and follow him in resurrection. So this means that, again, Jesus' resurrected body is, is how we're going to be. We're going to be made like him. Our glorification is personal, but watch this. It's not just individual. It, it's communal. Our glorification means that we will be glorified together. Every brother and sister in the Lord, every person who knows Christ. It's why C.S. Lewis said, you've never met a mere mortal. We, we are living among those who are going to be glorified someday if they've trusted in Christ. It's why we want all of our friends, everybody we know, all of our family members to come to faith in Jesus. And see, we also have the Spirit, he says. The Spirit of God is in us, verifying our adoption. But at the same time, it amplifies this longing to be home. I mean, the closer we come to Christ, the more we understand our world is broken and the more we grieve over all that's happening in our world. Our glorification is personal. But listen, it, it, it's, it's, it's communal. In fact, he says in John 17, 22, the glory that you have given me, I have given them that they may be one even as we are one. See, this glorification that Jesus enjoys becomes what we enjoy as well. We don't take on his divine nature, but we will have the same relationship with the Father that he has. So if you've been with us uh, through this time, we, we talked about justification. My justification, I'd say it this way, my identity in Christ, accepted by God as righteous, will actually match up with who I am, ultimately. I'd say it like this, glorification is the union of my justification in real time. This is why Paul, see, for Paul, glorification was in the aorist tense. It was a past action with full effect now in the present. The glorification of Jesus is the union of this, of his resurrection. And my glorification is directly tied to his resurrection. That's when, when we say when he, when he was buried, we too were buried. When he rose again, we too were raised up with him. See, it's a done deal. When I believe and receive his gift of forgiveness, my sanctification, watch this, will finally be realized in my glorification. Right now, there is a big gap between the two. But then I will be like, like Jesus. At his second coming, the glory of God, his praise and honor, majesty and holiness will be revealed and realized in us. And instead of being mortals burdened by sin and our sin nature, we'll be changed fully. He says in an instant when we see him, we'll become like him. When we behold him face to face, we will become, watch this, holy immortals with direct and unhindered access to the presence of God. And we will enjoy holy communion with him throughout all eternity. But our focus, watch this, it's not on our glory. I know we tend to run that way. It's on Christ who is for the Christian the hope of glory. That's why Paul said earlier, Romans 5, 2, through him, I love this, we have also obtained access by faith in this grace which we stand. If you've received Christ and we rejoice in hope, in the hope of glory, the glory of God. See, that hunger, that longing inside of all of us, the grief over this broken world, this gnawing in your soul, friends, listen, is for the glory of God. That's what it is. You may not know to, to name it, but it's a longing that you have. You, you might say, well, Jeff, I just need peace in my life, man. I got anxiety. anxiety. I, got, I just need peace. No, no, no. You, you need the, you, you're longing for the glory of God. You say, well, 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 no, but I mean, I just, I just got to make it through this season right here. I'm going to be okay. No, 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 no. You're longing for the glory of God. You're begging for it. Your soul longs for it. Listen, name it. It is the glory of God. You're longing with all creation for the glory of God. And this is the whole trajectory of our lives. The glory is so otherworldly, we don't even know how to long for it. Instead, we, we pursue these trivial things, the fleeting stuff of this world that will never satisfy our hunger. You do it, I do it, and we need to repent of it and say, I'll never be satisfied apart from pursuing him and his holiness and his glory in my life even now. This is what C.S. Lewis is getting at in his book, The Weight of Glory. He writes this, 
It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased, he says. See, we live our lives piddling around in lesser things because we don't know what we're made for. We don't know where we're heading, what we're becoming. We're like the caterpillar who saw a big butterfly flying overhead and he said, you'll never get me in one of those things. Yes, he will. If you're in Christ, it's going to happen. This glorification, listen, it is personal. You and I are going to be glorified. Lewis writes this. He says that the realization that the redeemed shall be approved by God is, is this. Delighted in. This is the weight of glory. We're going to be delighted in as an artist delights in his work or as a father delights in his son. This glorification is personal. You will be glorified. We will be. This is why you were born. This is why you were born again. Verse 24, he says, For in this hope you were saved. This is why you were saved. Not simply to live a life, you know, to be a good citizen, to vote correctly, retire and die and be beamed up to heaven. You were created to become like Jesus and to be glorified, ultimately, to be just like him. Now hope, he says, that is, that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what, he, what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Okay, I wanna close with this challenge. This is the hope of glory and it motivates everything we do. The hope gives us, this hope gives us power to persevere regardless of what comes our way. So I want you to think about your life, whatever you're going through right now. Friend, listen, never give up. Let this glory drive you to stay committed to Christ. Jesus is the prize himself. We live with the end in sight and it is our glorification. But God himself is the one who's glorified. Christ is glorified. See, even our glorification is to his glory. We become trophies of his grace. We point to him and we do so even now. Becoming like Jesus, we point everyone to him. Because here's what's gonna happen. We're going to be changed in an instant. We're gonna be together. We will be like Christ. And when we are glorified, we will see him as he is. And we're going to have an official role and place in this resurrected earth, in our resurrected bodies, worshiping a resurrected Savior. And you can live with hope today, friends. You see, patience and endurance through suffering is a mark. It's a sign that you are a believer, that you belong to Christ. It's why it says in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light. Momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient. Friend, they're fleeting, but the things that are unseen are eternal. What is the focus of your life? I mean, is this your life? Are you driven by the explosive power of a new affection in Jesus? Are you captured by this vision of glorification that someday will be yours? Listen, it's incomparable, it's universal, and it's personal. Only if you know Jesus. So I wanna lead us in a prayer right now that would guide you. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Give your life to him right now. This week, Rabbi Zacharias passed away and he said this, like a child who suddenly stops sobbing when he is clasped in the arms of his mother. 
such will be the grip of heaven upon our souls. Friend, there's coming a day when you will face eternity, you'll stand before a holy God, and the only way that we can do so and enter into glory with him is by receiving Jesus Christ as our Savior. And if you've not done that right now, wherever you are, you can say yes to him by faith. Say, Lord, I believe. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I give you my life. Now make me the person that you've created me to be. Friend, we can rest in him. Do you have this assurance? Let us live for the glory of God, to the glory of God and for the glorification to come. Eternity weighs in the balance. Give your life to him right now. Lord, we love you. We long to see you face to face. In your name we pray, amen and amen. Here's what I want you to do. If you've received Christ or you want someone to pray for you right now, I want you to text the word Jesus, text the name Jesus. You can see it there on the screen. We'd love to serve you in some way. We'd love to help you follow Jesus every single day. Praise be to God. The Lord is our salvation.